Okay, thank you, Avi. First of all, I want to apologize about my voice. So I'm just recovering from a very nasty cold. So, but I guess this is like reasonable for this intimate uh, gathering. So uh, please feel free like to stop me at any point if you have any questions. A bit like Trump, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope that he didn't bring any protesters with you. <laughs> okay, so, so the title is a bit long, like, like uh, Avi said. It has two parts. Uh, maybe the first part looks like more familiar to, the, to, to you guys here. But I actually want to start with the, with the second part about Clara Yen, which is the application, and then we'll get into nonlinear games and, and compact groups. So in the spirit of our election uh, season, <laughs> so Bernie Sanders is not here, but you can see uh, a publication like this in, in very prestigious journals like uh, Nature and Science. So this particular one is from Nature of last year. It says the revolution will not be crystallized. And if you read here, it says move over expert crystallography, cryotomycroscopy is kicking up a storm in structural biology by revealing the hidden machinery of the cell. Or a couple of years ago in science, the resolution revolution. And again, you can, you can uh, read closely. Together with other recent high resolution cryon structures, this achievement heralds the beginning of a new era in molecular biology. The structures at near atopic resolution are no longer the prerogative of expert crystallography or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And just earlier this year, cryotomicroscopy was chosen as method of the year. Uh, method of the year. Yeah, yeah. So, so they give uh, numbers like ten, nine, like uh, a beautiful. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so, so it's the method of the year 2015 for its like new. Like Thomas Floyd last year, last year, no? Method of the. Year. <laughs> I don't think this will get into nature <laughs> method. <so. laughs> But maybe it's a good, maybe in the TCS, you also want to consider method of the year. <laughs> the algorithm of the year, the proof of the year. Yeah, so for its new found ability to support in structure at near atomic resolution. And what you see here is a 2.2 angstrom resolution uh, reconstruction. <coughs> and some very interesting structures were, uh, have been resolved using uh, cryotomicroscopy. So I'll give you an example from a few months ago. Uh, the structure of, of, I'm sure that you heard about Zika and, and, and the Zika virus uh, structure was found using cryoEM. Okay, so wha wha what is going on? Wha why uh, cryoEM? <coughs> so many of you probably heard about expert crystallography as, as the classical way of, of uh, finding structures of, of biological macromolecules at, at atomic cell resolution. But actually there are many biological macromolecules like protein that withstood all attempts to crystallize them. And then you need to find some alternative. And cryoEM is nice in the sense that no crystallization is needed. So you can actually get molecules in their native state. And the other advantage that I will not talk about so much today is, is heterogeneity, that is, Molecules like proteins actually have several conformations, not just one single structure. So, so they change their shape, they, they have several deformations, and, and actually in cryoEM you can get all of those deformations, not just one as a structure, like you get in a crystal. And you can also ask, okay, so why now we have all this uh, sudden uh, flourish in, in the area of cryoEM? And it's really a technological uh, advance that there has been, there's been like major improvement, improvement in detector technology that allow us to get now to much higher resolution. And I'll not talk about this technology here today. Okay, so how does cryoEM work? It's actually very simple. What they do, they take the molecules and instead of crystallizing them, they freeze them in a very, very thin layer of ice. The ice layer is so thin that if you look at it in the vertical direction, you'd see at most one molecule or no molecule at all. And they freeze it using liquid nitrogen. And at the moment of freezing, every molecule just picks a random orientation and a random position within the ice layer. So what you see are not 
steel molecule is at Alpix concept. And so you have the molecule, the 3D object embedded in the ice layer. And then you shoot an electron beam perpendicular to the ice layer. The electron beam goes through the ice, through the molecule, if there is a molecule there. And then if we have a film, a camera that simply gives you two-dimensional tomographic images of the 3D object. So by tomographic images, what I mean is the path integral of the scattering potential created by the molecule. However, these images are actually very noisy. They don't really look like the images that I show you here. And the reason why they're so noisy is that as the electron beam goes through the molecule, uh, it, has, it is so highly energetic that it breaks the chemical bond that make the, the molecule. And you don't want to apply too much uh, radiation because af otherwise it will not be the molecule that we are really interested in. So there is a, a maximum radiation dose that can be applied. And this renders very, very noisy images that we'll see later on in the talk. So the first step is to do some kind of image segmentation, to do particle selection or particle picking from a big micrograph. And then you take those 2D particle images and the classical cry ample needs to estimate the 3D structure from those micrographs, noisy micrographs. So you assume that this is all the same molecule in different positions? Right, so that's why I put here the word classical. So for classical it means that, yeah, I, I first assume that all molecules have exactly the same identical structure. They only differ by their orientation and position within the ice layer. Uh, but like I mentioned before, in, in practice this is not true. Molecules can actually come in different conformation. And this is called the heterogeneity problem. Actually, Roy is one of the main experts on this. And, but for the most of the talk today, I'll assume that all of them have the same structure. And only at the very, very end, I'll mention it. What can we do with it when it's not the case? Other questions? Good. So. Yeah, so people have tried, but not very successfully. I mean, what happens in, 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 in practice is that uh, sometimes what happens is that uh, all molecules have a preferred orientation. For example, they want to be aligned with the substrate that, that, that holds them. And then it's actually bad news because you don't get views from, from other directions. <coughs> Okay, but right. So the, the the issue with shooting the beam from from different direction is that uh, I mean sometimes people use it. It's called electron tomography, so the electron microscopy. The issue, and that's what people do, for example, in medical imaging, right? So the patient is being instructed, do not move for the duration of the imaging process then the machine, let's say, scans the brain or some other organ. But the issue is that here, if, if, if you try doing tilting, then the issue is that also the, okay, so you cannot get to 90 degrees, okay, the because then will fall they will not fall, but basically you integrate many, many molecules at the same time. So there is a maximum angle tilt angle that is allowed. Also, if you think of the thickness of the ice is different. And so, and then you have an issue of that's called the missing wedge problem. Uh, and typically it gets it gives you also much lower resolution if you try to do actually tilt series and image all molecules. Okay, so <coughs> so for senior particle reconstruction, the mathematical model is very, very simple and actually I simplified it even further for you today by ignoring some effects to give you a microscope, the microscope aberration and so on. So what we collect are n images. Let, let's say the ice image has pixel x and x, y pixel. So let's say we have local coordinate system, x and y. So the x, y pixel is simply the path integral of the scattering potential after rotating the molecule phi by the annual rotation ri. Very, very simple model. That is, if you know the rotation, then the image formation model is, is a linear model, just like in medical imaging. However, in CryoEM, 
because we don't know the rotation, then there is a very problematic and strange nonlinear dependence. Okay, so we cannot simply now invert this operator, okay, because it's very nonlinear. So the Krarian problem is really an inverse problem, a nonlinear inverse problem, in which you want to estimate phi and maybe also the rotation given the noisy input. That's it. Okay, that's the classical Krarian problem. Obviously, if we can estimate the rotation, then we reduce the problem to a linear inverse problem for which we have tools for medical imaging how to solve. Rather than? Uh, oh, this is just a uh, index for, for the first row, second row, third row. Yeah, it just means so you can understand that we integrate z and we remain with a, a picture of x and y after rotating phi. Okay, so here is a very <laughs> simple example. Suppose that you don't know this structure, I don't give it to you, but you see 12 images of, of this kind. You don't know the viewing direction and you want to estimate the 3D structure. So here it's easy, I mean, by just looking at some of the pictures, we can make some very clever guesses, but in reality, the images look like this, okay? They are much, much noisier. And so just to illustrate that we can actually get to construction. So here, what you see here is a sample of four images out of a much larger sample of 27,000 particle images from our collaborator, Fred Sigrist from Yale Medical School. And this is a reconstruction that we actually did several years ago with two of my former students, Ramzin and Jay. And you'll see it now. <coughs> so in yellow, you see the ground truth because that is the, the subunit of the ribosome. And there was a Nobel Prize for getting the structure of the ribosome. And in white, you see our reconstruction from the 27,000 images. Of course, I'm cheating here a little bit because we don't see X-ray resolution here, okay, it's not atomic ray resolution. And by then we had a lot of improvement, both in technology and algorithm, but at least you can see that the structures are very, very similar. So okay. why did you construct uh, Oh, we just filtered it. Specimen, yeah. So, uh, <coughs> so, so really the issue is that, that, that there is a radiation damage and you want to limit it as much as possible. So you want to do a, just a single piece here. So is there a result from the same method you got the right pressure or somebody got the Nobel Prize for getting out the structure and this was by Kirchner or something? Yeah, so actually there is a long story here. <laughs> uh, actually the, the, there was a low resolution uh, Krarian structure of the ribosome that was used by Ada Yanat and Venti and Krishna and to get the, uh, to get the crystal structure at the end. They used it as an initialization. So there was some kind of uh, merge effort here. So they used both Krarian and Kirchner. Yeah, they used the results from. Uh, right. So some people, for example, believe that Yasmin Frank for his efforts on doing like the Krarian low resolution structure should have been also included, but I don't want to get, I don't want to get into <laughs> emotional discussion. Okay, <laughs> I'm not a part of this. But anyway, the, the Krarian that you use, uh, the, the similar pressure? Or similar results, yeah, because it's using uh, all detectors. With the new detectors, we can get much higher resolution. Yeah, so usually we only work on data that was either already published or you can find in a repository, like public repository. So we don't, so maybe you should know that actually the molecular biology department at Princeton is getting a microscope and this will be available uh, later this, I mean later this academic year, yeah. And they are, it costs like $5 million, the microscope, and together with the detectors and other instrumentation, it gets in a computer, it can get easily for like $8 million. And they bring a, a senior experimentalist and all of the goods. So it's, it's, it's a large investment. So it's a method that you love to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
No, so you have to realize that like many institutions, universities, the NIH research institutions, they make now very large investments in cloud. Yeah. It's really taking over the, the space of world this year. Okay, so there so are many uh, algorithm computational challenges in, in cloud. Yeah. And today, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll focus on water and computer will be one of the main challenges, which, which is how to do ab initio model really, how to find the structure without any, having any guess or reference to what the structure should be. And maybe I'll mention a little bit about the GB native, which is actually in the field is believed to be like the main computational issue. And there are many other issues like how to denoise images, how to pick them from the micrograph, and so on and so forth that I will not go into today. Okay, so before actually starting with the 3D to REM problem, let's, let's begin with a much, much simpler problem, which in 1D instead of 3D, where that we call multi-reference alignment. So what is the problem of multi-reference alignment? <coughs> we have one-dimensional signal, and think of them as a signal, here I just depict them as a signal between zero and one, but think of them as a signal between, let's say, zero to two pi on the unit circle. So, and every, and let's say there is an underlying clean signal that you want to estimate, and you, you observe many, and it's multi, <laughs> uh, noisy instances of it, each time with some arbitrary shift or rotation of the circle. The crowning problem is more complicated because we see a projection after rotation. But first of all, we need to understand this very simple problem if we want to make any progress with the crowning problem. <coughs> so obviously, if, if, if you do have the clean template in your disposal, you can do, you, you can do anything you like. So if you piece, piece a template, even with your eye, you can align them. If you have a noisy reference and you have the clean template, you can do match filtering just doing correlation and find the, the shift. Problems become more interesting, like in the aquarium problem, where you want to see noisy references. You don't have the clean template, so you want to estimate it. If noise is not too bad, still by correlation you can find the shift and then average. But the really interesting regime is when noise is very high, the SNR is very low, and this is what we see here in, in, in the red scenario. And in the red scenario, if you're going to do some co correlation test between any pair of signals, you'll get garbage. Uh, <laughs> is there a given dimension to this? Like you That's a good question for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> all right. So, so from just two signals, you won't be able to do anything. But maybe if we have, let's say, three or more, I don't know, thousand or ten thousand or hundred thousand signals, maybe we can still estimate the the underlying signal. Okay. <laughs> So I, I want to estimate the between, two, right? no, no, between every two there is just one uh, there is between one every two there is just one parameter but if you think between n of them there is going to be n choose two parameters actually there are only n parameters yeah. just the shifts of, of yeah. each one of them so one thing that we need to keep in mind is that if noise is very high even if I'm an oracle and I know what is the underlying clean signal I won't be able to estimate the shifts correctly because the noise, the, the signals are just too noisy. So you can ask yourself, oh, is, is there really hope in, in, in such high level of noise to actually estimate the underlying signal? So you can ask, oh, maybe there is some kind of uh, phase transition. Maybe there is some critical signal to noise ratio below which we won't be able to estimate the, the underlying clean signal. And maybe you think, no, at any SNR, no matter how small it could be, if I have enough signals, when n goes to infinity, I should be able to estimate the, the clean signal. So maybe that's a question for you. So who thinks here that, that uh, there is a SNR below which we we'll never be able to estimate the clean signal? Okay, who thinks that we should always be able to estimate the clean signal? Okay. Okay, so there, is a few, there are a few ends that think that we should be able. Most of you do not want to commit. That's fine. Don't cut your vote. <laughs> if, if you assume that this is the noisy truly endless, no, no, I, I mean truly noisy noise, so it must be, yeah, the signal must be. Okay. Right, so, so the noise is not adversary, okay? 
So I agree that if noise is adversary, we cannot do anything. So they can just add noise to change the signal to some other signal. And we cannot do anything. <laughs> If you can find for a small subset, not for a large subset, that may be an answer. Okay, so, so, so the answer is, is, is positive, like, like some of you thought it would be. And one way to see it is using uh, shift and run features. So here is a very simple model in this case. So a noisy measurement are shifts or rotations of the underlying clean signal, X, corrupted with noise. And we, let's say that we have signals of length L, and noise is just Gaussian, Gaussian white noise with, with variant signal squares. Now, even if we don't know the shifts, we can estimate shifts in variant features. So the first feature, the most simple one, is just the average history value. Or in Fourier language, is the, the zero frequency. So if I average the zero frequency of all noisy samples, of all noisy references, I will convert to the zero frequency of the clean one. So I can estimate just the average history value easily if the number of signals is greater than sigma squared. Okay, from the central limit theorem, I need n to be greater than sigma squared because the variance of my estimator goes down like sigma squared over n. And then you say, oh, so let's try to find more invariants. So the second invariant is the power spectrum, which is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. So the autocorrelation is again invariant. Okay, so the power spectrum is just I'm going to take the, the, the squared magnitude of, of the Fourier transform. And if you think about it, when you shift the signal, then every Fourier coefficient gets some phase factor. But after taking the absolute value, that, that disappears. Okay, so it is invariant. And again, by averaging, now you have an addition of sigma squared because of the noise variance. And because we're squaring, now we need n to be greater than sigma to the four. So with n greater than sigma to the four, I can still estimate the, the power spectrum of the clean signal. Well, I'm still missing the phases. So without any additional assumptions, I don't know, compact support of the signal or some, something like that, we need to go to higher order invariants, and this is known as the bispectrum. So that's actually terminology that was invented by uh, John Tukey, I think. And what is the bispectrum? The bispectrum is actually taking the product of three Fourier coefficients. So you take three Fourier co coefficients such that the sum of the three frequency is zero. So you take frequency k1, frequency minus k2, I just put complex conjugate here, but think of it as minus k2, and then k2 minus k1. So the three frequency, they add up to zero. Hence, when you shift the signal, each one of them gets some phase shift, but they cancel out each other. And that's invariant. And so now, I'm sorry? So right. And Right, so the, the fourth order is called tri spectrum, but in that case, it's from then on, we're just called higher order spectra. And, and then we need n to be greater than sigma to the six. Now, why I stopped here and not uh, <laughs> went further is because that for generic signal, if, say, the power spectrum does not vanish, then we can invert <coughs> the bi spectrum. Okay, so unlike the power spectrum, which is not invertible or missing the phase information, actually the bi spectrum preserves the phase information. And once we estimate the bi spectrum, we can invert it and get the, si the original signal up to a global shift. So the message here is that if you give me enough signals with n greater than sigma to the six or one over SNR cubed, then I can estimate the, the underlying signal. How to actually do the inversion? There are some people here that, 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 that do it, and it actually, it touches other problems <laughs> in the theoretical CS that I want to, don't want to get into today. But, but the message is that it, it is possible to accurately reconstruct the signal from sufficiently many noisy shifted copies for arbitrary low SNR without estimating the shift. Even when estimating the shift, we know it, it will be a poor thing to do. Now, uh, Yeah, if I have time and I can do a search over L to the N, right, I, I'll do it. But my computer can do it. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that under this assumption that you can do it. So
So it's actually a good question. It's, it's we actually don't have uh, a theoretical guarantee that maximum likelihood, for example, will give you the, the sigma. Okay, I mean, it's very plausible, but we don't have a guarantee. You 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 are a very smart guy. Maybe you can. <laughs> but, but, but if we know that this works, this we can know it works. Yes, it doesn't mean that maximum likelihood will work. But we can discuss it later. By the way, the next thing that I'm going to show is how to do maximum likelihood, which because in practice it does work very well. But I don't. I just don't have a, a guarantee that that indeed that. But do you know how far this is from uh, from information or what is in the? Yeah. Okay. So there is a, a recent result by my, my former student Alfonso Bandera, and uh, and a couple of other students from uh, actually three other students and Philippe Pizolet from MIT, where they show that sigma to the six is not only an upper bound, it's also a lower bound, okay? For generic signals. And if, if you, if y for non-generic signals, then it's actually you need many more than sigma to the six. You can get to some sigma to the L. Yeah, I mean, that's what we do now with, yeah. with Joao, right? Yeah, but, but we still don't have like a... Yeah, but in general, it's the same thing. If you don't have implied in bound, why can't we do nothing with all this error and then find the sigma to the sigma and then see the sigma? So that's, I mean, we, we have research in progress that maybe... Yeah, so if, if, if we understand, then it is two parameters, then it is the two sigmas to the L, right? So it is L to the L, then it is L some... Let's move on, okay? So. Oh, don't worry, well, I'm not putting a sign right now. I'm just yeah, no. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> so, what generic are you referring to? So, generic, for example, here is that the power stacking does not vanish. Okay. Okay, so now we want to move from 1D to 3D to do power again. And. <coughs> And there was a very nice paper that was published, as you can see. It was submitted just after I was born, <laughs> okay, a long time ago. <laughs> and by Tzvi Kam from the Weizmann Institute. And it's called the Reconstruction of Structure from an Earth Mark Rush of Randomly Oriented Particles. And Kam does not phrase it in this way. But really what he's doing is, is trying to estimate invariant invariance, just as he did now for the meter of Estelani. So let's, let's just read it very quickly. A new method for enhancing and reconstructing the three-dimensional structure for randomly oriented particles from their electron micrographs is developed. The method requires as an input many pictures of randomly oriented identical particles. The analysis is based on the calculation of the simulation of the special correlation of the densities on the electron micrograph from which the spherical harmonics coefficient, that's the analog of the Fourier transform in, in 3D, of the structure can be found. The process of enhancement of the special correlation and the averaging out of the background noise enables the construction of electron by use of pictures with low signal polarization. A theory is presented and it's also anticipated. Okay, so to understand what Kam suggests, let, let, let's, uh, let's go over some very important uh, theorem from tomography, computer tomography. And this is the Fourier progression slice theorem. And it is a very simple theorem to state. On the one end, we have the monosphere from 3D objects. And you can consider it two-dimensional projection. And now you can take the 2D Fourier transform of every projection image. You can ask what is the relationship between the 2D Fourier transform of the projection image and the Fourier transform of the 3D object. Well, every 2D Fourier transform, every such plane is nothing but the restriction of the 3D Fourier transform of the molecule to a center slice that goes through the origin. And the orientation of that slice is completely determined by the orientation of the molecule or the viewing direction. 
Actually, if you think about it, that's how medical imaging works. No, 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 nothing random here. This is so the everything is deterministic. The molecule is shifting, so yeah. You, you project it down, and then you shift the electrons down. Right. So what is the okay? So what, what is the so, so if you th okay, so if you think about the Fourier transform, is an integral. Also, projection is an integral. The state integral is, is just changing the order of integration. You can either first project and then do two D Fourier transform. Or you can first do 3D Fourier transform and then with speak to a plane. The two are just exactly the same, and you can prove it in one. Right, but uh, but but uh, right, it's a delta. It's, it's a, a single omega, right? Yeah. Right. So in medical imaging, the way it works, you get you get projection from many different directions. Each one of you get gives you a central plane in the Fourier space. In order to get the density in it, it's exactly the inverse. In Quarian, the issue is that we don't know the orientation, so we know that we get measurement in the Fourier domain along over planes, but they're unorganized. So what Kant said is that fine, even if they're unorganized, we can still compute statistics. So let's try to think what could be invariant features. Well, all the planes go through the origin. Okay, and so we can still assume that they have that pixel value. Okay, they're just yeah, integrating all the pixels in, in every image. Fine, that's not a lot of information. Can we do more than that? <coughs> if you think about it, in the general case, we have no other invariants. So he said, okay, let's assume that the orientations are completely uniform. Okay, so let's, let's say that the rotations are just sampled from the Hau measure of ray flow three. In that case, you can now do more. You can estimate the second of the statistic. So the way you do it, Let's do it in, 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 the, in the 3D Fourier space. So pick two, fi two frequencies, say K1 and K2, that you want to correlate between them, okay? So there is going to be an image that goes through those two frequencies together with the origin. And now just look at the exactly those two frequencies in, in the image plane in all the other images. What it does for you is basically integration, right? because in the other images they look at different places. So now it's basically what you computed is the autocorrelation of the Fourier transform of the molecule with itself over SO3. Okay, by summing over all images, basically they integrated over the group over SO3. So you compute the autocorrelation, and in SO3, the analog of the Fourier transform is now the spherical harmonic, right? And so you can expand the Fourier transform of the molecule in spherical harmonic. So these are the spherical harmonic, and these radial functions of the frequency are unknown, but for every L in the spherical harmonic expansion, well this matrix CL, think of it as some kind of correlation or covariant matrix that you can estimate from the data, and this is related to the, to the unknown ALM in this way. Okay, so in matrix notation, you can just write that CL, which is known from the data, is AL, AL transpose, a complex transpose function. So this is a generalization of the missing phase from the power spectrum. So we get magnitudes of the Fourier transform. Here we get, in some sense, the magnitude of these matrices. Okay, so from the CL, we can get AL, but only up to an orthogonal matrix of size 2L plus 1 by 2L plus 1. So we also call it the just like we have the phase retrieval program in, in crystallography because we measure the, the power spectrum. So here we call it the orthogonal retrieval program that we still need to solve. What, what was the LM so L up to the uh, utmost frequency that you can uh, get. Okay, so <coughs> so the Nyquist, I mean, essentially you want to go all, all the way up to the Nyquist. <coughs> Yeah. 
Right, so that's also what... So there is an issue, okay? So, so uh, in Quarium, you cannot really take any three frequencies because they must be supported on the plane, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot... Com it, it's not like you see the old 3D volume. So you, cannot, you only can take three frequencies on the same plane, um, and then also you have this averaging process. So it's not clear, right? I mean, we're working on this, okay? If, if it's actually invertible, like we have in the 1D case. Okay, so you can ask, if, if Kant proposed it uh, already in uh, 77, and it took three years to publish. Yeah, but so basically it was uh, almost completely ignored, okay? Because it was an idea that was ahead of its time. Uh, the reason it was ahead of its time, first of all, there was just not enough data at the, at the time theaters to calculate second and third order statistics. I mean, at the time they had 10 images, 100 images at best, okay? And our goal was to make statistics of, of like three order 10 goals. Uh, <coughs> And also there is the argument that the distribution must be uniform. And like I mentioned before, in, in practice, actually, this assumption is violated. Okay, so it's really nice in, in theory, but like in practice, it doesn't work very well. So in my group now, we're actually trying to fix this part of, of, <laughs> of, of <laughs> that we need uniform uh, green direction. And, and again, in the spirit of the elections, we're trying to make Kam's method great again. Why? Ask the molecule. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it has some preferential direction. So usually they just prefer, for example, like to connect to the carbon sphere and the substrate with some, with some preference. It's like how if, if, if you throw a cat on the floor, right? It usually falls in, in, in one direction, but <laughs> not in any direction. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> okay, so if they don't use CAM theory, th th then what do they use, okay? They don't wait for us to solve all the problems. So, so, wha so what they do is, is a very simple and standar standard iterative procedure where they first guess what the structure of the molecule should be like, and they call this guess phi naught. Given phi naught, you can now project it in many different directions get projection images of phi naught, 2D projection images of phi naught. And now you take the noisy experimental images and you match them with the, uh, with the, clean, temp with the clean template that we just produced for phi naught. And once you do that, you basically assign new viewing direction, new attentions to all the experimental images, and you solve the medical <coughs> imaging problem, you reconstruct a new structure, phi 1, and you repeat this process until convergence. So and you can do it in a more uh, clever way, let's say, using computation maximization. And it is known to converge to a local uh, optimal, but not necessarily the global one. And <coughs> there are some issues that, okay, also how to do it fast. We, we are thinking about ways and other groups are, are doing it. But the main issue is that there is model bias. That is, if, we, if, if Avi starts from one molecule and Ran starts from a different molecule, they may convert to to different structures, and especially when there is some small substructure that you care about, and it can be like really heavily biased by, by your initial guess. Mm -hmm. so it's also like the amount of molecules that start from different structures. Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> so the question is: Is there a completely reference-free orientation assignment and, and, and reconstruction procedure? Is it possible? Yeah. Question. Well, how would it be healthy to get a cube of ice? I don't see. There's one very interesting distribution. Uh, if, you, if you have a cube of ice and then you can slice it, oh, to slice it right. in any direction you like, then you can get the image. I'll, I'll ask my experimental friend <laughs> if it's possible. I want to do it, but. 
<laughs> but usually they are very, they are very smart. So it, it, it <laughs> no, I mean it's very, it's, it's no, I mean it, when, when it comes when it comes to making the experiment the experiment work, it's very hard to beat them. I, we can beat them in terms of the algorithms, but but. I'm just wondering whether it's a constraint of the method to start from a single i, so uh, you can you can feed it an i in an indirect way. I mean, I know just I'm drawing an analogy. In some way, in all biology, in some way, they they uh, they mix like this. I mean, uh, it's I, I agree. It's a good question. I'll, 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 I'll forward the question and give you an answer. <laughs> okay. So, so we go back to the Fourier projection slice here, and <coughs> and the Fourier projection slice here will give us now again a way to 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 do a completely reference-free or intentional simulation. So. What we know from the slice theorem, as we said before, that if we look at the 2D Fourier transform of two projection image, co they are corresponding to two slices. We don't know their intentions, but what we do know that no matter what two slices they are, we know that two planes in, in R3 will intersect at a line. And so this is called the common line, meaning that we should be able to find one line, let's say the red line in image I and, and the red line in image J, on which the transform values completely agree. Okay, so if there is not too much noise, we should be able to find that line. And we know where they intersect. Once we know where the two planes intersect, well, there is still one degree of freedom, the angle between the two planes. But we can figure out that angle by adding a third plane. Okay, so this take us to the 80s. So it, this was discovered independently by Weinstein and Goncharov in 86 and then here in the 70s. Goncharov is now actually a math professor at Yale in Russia. Uh, <coughs> but the issue is that in, in again, in, it's, it's really nice in, it's, it's an algorithm that's very nice in theory, but in practice it doesn't work very well. And the reason it doesn't work is because of noise. We have a lot of misidentification of common lines. So one thing that we proposed a few years ago was to try to solve this optimization problem, a least squares problem, meaning that if we denote, let's say, x i j y i j, where image j intersects with image i and the local coordinates of image i, and similarly for image j, and that's a pen zero degree zero, take them three dimensional vector, then you know that if you rotate c i j with the true rotation Ri, and if we rotate Cji with the true rotation Rj, you should get the same direction, the same vector. So you should get an order of n squared linear equation, and you have only an order of n variables, the rotation. So we should be in a very favorable situation, and we can try to minimize this quadratic loss function. Well, this should start looking familiar to you guys, okay? You can think of it as, as, as an instance of, of a problem like Little Goes Too Big, of a non-commutative group. And so we did some spectral and semi-definite program relaxation with it, following the Gomez-Williamson uh, relaxation. And it worked well, but unfortunately not with the experimental images. You need to denoise them a little bit. If you've ever had the images, you know, to, to boost the X now. And <coughs> yeah, so for every pair, you find a common line. Complete graph, yeah. But but that's uh, that I can still apply the SBT, right? Uh, so so <laughs> you mean the 
here. So here it's actually like rank three. So, uh, <coughs> right, the, but, but, but you can, by now you sh you sh it should be clear why it doesn't work so well with experimental images. Just like the pairwise alignment algorithm with the 1D in the 1D mutation scanning form didn't work, like low SNR, right? We said it will give us garbage every time if you compare pairs of images. Also here, when we compare pairs of images and find the common line, we'll get garbage. So it doesn't matter like how much we try to improve, remove the square, make it more robust. It, if the algorithm only sees this geometrical information in, in the form of the CIJ, you lose all the information that is in the image. Okay, so, <coughs> so what we would really like to do is to somehow, so, so again, I claim that there is a lot of other information in the images that is not used by any common line procedure. It is a procedure that first try to extract common lines and then try to feed the common lines. And the reason, for example, let's say that your algorithm predicts some rotation, you can calculate what are the common lines that are implied by those rotation, go back to the images, and then if you see that those lines are very, very different, and it's improbable for this to be common lines, well, this should be ruled out in the first place. But you just didn't have this information to begin with. So what we really want to do is what the suggestion was that before let's let's do a full search. Okay, let's let's exhaust over SO3 to the end. And for every possible configuration of N rotation, calculate the common lines that are implied by them, look at the images, and give a score. Okay? The likelihood score if it's common line, you know it is Gaussian, you just say okay, the difference is also Gaussian. And so I'll, my score will be the sum of the square Euclidean differences between the common lines. It's not exactly in the clean line field, but for now, let, let, let's just uh, shove it under the rug. <coughs> so if, if you now try to formulate this mathematically, then what you need to solve is a problem of this kind. Now, where does this problem arise from? So for every pair of images, i, i, and j, I'm going to have a different cost function. It's a function over SO3. And the reason being is that the common line only depends, the pair of common lines, the directions in the two images only depend on the relative rotation, ri times rj inverse. That's an easy thing to see that you can convince yourself. And so you can tabulate those functions ahead of time. For every pair of images, you can you can prepare that function, Fij, ahead of time before any maximization has taken place as a function over SO3. And now you want to solve this minimization problem to find a set of rotation that will minimize the sum of square Euclidean distances between all common lines. Now this function is an ugly function <laughs> in the sense that it's very nonlinear. If you just change the rotation a little bit, the relative rotation a little bit, the lines direction change, and then the values of the images change, so they can change drastically, okay? Oh, it's, not continuous. it's continuous, okay, but but it's it's very erratic. Okay. <coughs> no, actually if you have images of your know, size, hundred by hundred pixels, then and let's say it's noisy and so on. I mean, <coughs> and you think, okay, I, I mean, I'll, I'll get to it very soon, but you can say, okay, well, how do I actually tabulate that function Fij, the function over SO3? You need to go to, say, frequencies up to, I don't know, 10 or 20, okay? But we'll, I, I'll, I'll get to it very soon. So they're band limited functions, but they're not nice functions. So the way that we're going to, okay, I don't know how to minimize the, this problem and find the, <laughs> the exact solution. So what we're going to try to, some, to do some relaxation. And the relaxation that I'm going to propose is using Kennedy frame programming. And this is going to use also a rotation theory of control space. <coughs> so just conceptually, the problem that we're trying to solve is actually of solving a puzzle, if you think about it puzzle over the globe or over the sphere. 
So you have n pieces of the puzzle, and between any pair of pieces, you have a cost function. These are far apart, you don't care about. Okay, the cost is zero. If they overlap, well, the cost is going to be like plus infinity. And only if they touch each other, now you can use it in this proof code. So for every pair of pieces, you can do, you, you only care about the relative rotation between them, and then you have a cost. So to solve the puzzle, the computer will need to solve this kind of problem. Okay, so now we finally get <laughs> to nonlinear games. So why do I call this nonlinear games? Because one of the formulations of, of, of linear games is using the problem max p lin over vf, which is we have a system of linear equations where every equation is only two variables, only the difference between the two variables. And we have the equation modulo L. So the group here is actually integers modulo L. And you can think about the problem of, of assigning integer variables that will maximize the number of satisfied equations to minimization of the same cost that we had before, where the cost is very simple. Just minus one if the equation is satisfied, zero if it is not satisfied. So, so we see that the, that the formula, formula in general, for compact groups in general, encodes linear games. However, the problems that we care about are a bit more general in the sense that, first of all, the cost is not just a zero or one cost, it's not just a delta function. We, get, we have different costs or different score for every assignment of variable. And also the group is not necessarily finite. It's not necessarily the permutation group or VL, like we have in the new games. So we call it non-unique games. Not unique because for <laughs> there is not unique assignment, so different scores, different costs. Two CSPs. I'm sorry? Two CSPs. Two CSPs. Two CSPs. Why two CSPs? Okay, so, so educate me, why two CSPs? Well, because it's Yeah. yeah. So that's okay. So 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 I should change it to, to two unique games? No, no, just two CSPs. Two CSPs, okay. Yeah, that's a general <laughs> idea. We don't have yeah, we don't con we are not constrained in our <laughs> system. Okay. Okay. Over okay, very, very very good. So two CSPs over a compact group. So <coughs> how how do we go about this? So this should look familiar. Let's, let's start with the simple case FA2. So we can extend any function in L2 to the Fourier series. And the Fourier coefficients are given by integrals. Again, Fourier exponential. <coughs> and this generalizes very nicely to any compact group. So the Fourier exponentials become irreducible representation. So <coughs> they're also unitary. So this rho kg is, is in general a matrix size dk by dk. So dk is the dimension of the representation. And so because these are matrices, so we need to like deface here. If you take the inner product between the Fourier coefficients and the irreducible representation, and the Fourier coefficients, just like here, are obtained by averaging over the group. So dg is the Hall measure over the group. And so fg is the function, and it's just the complex conjugate transpose of, of, of the unitary representation. So do you agree now with all these solutions that uh, you represent the problem as such, that uh, all of them should be? No. I think you also say this is the hard measure and not the zero. No, the hard measure is just to expand the cost function. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to explain any new distribution. <coughs> So, okay, it's a good question. So, okay, the images are sampled, let's say, on 100 by 100 degree. So this means that if I don't want to go above Nyquist, <laughs> okay, I, sh I, I should cut this, this extension at, at, at the Nyquist frequency. Okay, so like I said before, in practice, because of noise, there are frequencies that 
do not capture actually our information so we stop at 12 or 16 and that's the ballpark okay so how do we go about solving this problem so we're going okay so solving this optimization problem is, 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 is difficult for me okay maybe also for you so I'm going to linearize it and <coughs> so that was one introducing the, the Fourier transform and to linearize I'm furthermore going to do the trick of matrix lifting so though we have only n variables I'm now going to do n squared variables so for every pair ij of, of group elements and for every sequence ek we're going to introduce this variable x a j k we use this to the representation of order k of the ratio and then we can write the cost function each of the n squared cost functions in terms of the full expansions and just replace the rho k g i g j here by x a j k so now the cost is linear fantastic the problem is that I, I can trivially minimize it by just choosing the x a j k to be say minus the complex conjugate transpose of the x i j k okay right so I drive it to minus infinity so we need some constraint on the x i j k okay so <coughs> tricky thing about the x i j k is that we reduce to the representation because they factorize and here we use also the unitary and so we can just observe very easily that if every x k is a positive semi definite matrix moreover it has identity blocks of the diagonal and we also need that the rank of the xk is beta now I claim that even if you keep the non-convex constraint the rank constraint you didn't solve the problem there are still missing constraints and the reason being is that there is nothing up till now that connects different frequency say frequency k and frequency k prime nothing here connects them so you just solve say if we go to frequency 16 16 different optimization problems and each one will give you different presumably different rotations if there is enough information <laughs> so we need a way to actually connect them okay <coughs> so we need an additional constraint okay so <coughs> so one way to introduce additional constraints is to think about the delta function over the group. So for example, if you think about the delta function over SOQ, you know that we can expand it to an infinite number of, of Fourier coefficients, of Fourier uh, exponentials. And if we shift it to anywhere, okay, so think about alpha I minus alpha j as the g i g j here, then we can express the delta function as a linear combination of the unknown variables with coefficients that are the Fourier exponentials. And what is nice about the delta function is that no matter where is the peak and what is alpha i minus alpha j, it's always the integral is one and always it is a non-negative function. So the integral being one is, is a bit trivial. It just tells that the zero order representation is one. That's not a lot of new information. But the fact that it's non-negative gives us a way to couple all the variables. So now finally we can couple f different frequencies. So if you think about it, what we have here now is a sum of Fourier exponentials. And for the sum, this superposition to be non-negative everywhere over the group this is a very non-trivial constraint. Okay, usually if you have sines and cosines, you write them together, you'll get something that oscillates below zero and uh, above zero. But no, here we want everything. But, here, but we're still facing with, with, with a couple of issues. First of all, I don't have infinite variables in my, <laughs> in my program, right? We need to cut it. And also we have, we have to constraint at any point. Again, this is like infinite number of constraints. Okay, so <coughs> question. Yeah, we will get to it very soon. 
Okay, so, so, so the first thing that one can do is to truncate the summation from minus infinity to plus infinity and say you want to truncate say, from minus 10 to plus 10. But if you do it this way, this gives rise to what is, called, what is known as the Dirichlet term. And it's very well known that the Dirichlet term oscillates also below zero. And this brings all the effects of ringing and the Gibbs phenomena to be fully exponential. But there is a very simple modification that was introduced by Thayer where you consider instead of the Dirichlet kernel, you consider the first order Chevao mean of the Dirichlet kernel. And it's just putting a linear filter on the Dirichlet kernel. And so you show that this kernel is positive. It's again a one line exercise to show that it's positive, no negative. Okay, so we already have one, one problem solved. So just constrain that this is no negative, okay? We saw the delta function. Now we look at the Thayer term. Still we have to deal with what is called every alpha. So how do we deal with every alpha? Remarkably, Thayer showed up again <laughs> to our rescue. And there is a Thayer Ritz uh, representation here that tells us that if P is a non-negative trigonometric polynomial, over the circle, then it must be the absolute value squared of another polynomial. Perhaps this is what, what you refer to. So we can think of it as sum of squares with just one term. Okay, and that's very easy to do as a positive, positive spin negative constraint. So actually every block x, i, j, k, in the case of SO2, you can just put a semi negative constraint on it. Okay, how to do it for SO3? you play the same yoga. Okay, so you take the delta function over SO3, you can expand it, expand the irreducible representation. Well, now actually you have to take the second order to draw on me. Actually, it's an interesting question how to construct positive kernels over a compact group in general. I mean, I don't know like a very definite answer to this question. But at least for SO3, we have a construction. And and then actually imply it at every point. What we do now, we just subsample SO3 and import it at, at many, many points. I mean, that <coughs> maybe it's not optimal, but that's what, what we do right now. Actually, in case of SO3, I mean, if, if you are willing to pay a computational price, you can then do SOS, sum of squares. So you know that, for example, the three by three matrix, the first order representation, is by the order of Dirichlet formula is just homogeneous polynomials of degree two in the unit quaternion, and so the convex hull of SO three, which was shown frequently by Sonderson, Farillo, and Wilson, and MIT, <coughs> you can just represent it using the four by four PSD constraint. So it uses the matrix Q is the quaternion times transpose, the four by four matrix. Obviously PSD, to drop the rank one constraint, trace must be one because it's unit quaternion. And the order Rodriguez tells you how the entries of Q and how the second order polynomials and, uh, <coughs> and the entries of the three by three matrix are related in a linear way. And that's the convex hull. I mean, that's what we show in the paper. And you can do it now for every k, actually, because the k is all the irreducible representation. The entries are homogeneous polynomials of degree 2k, just like the first order representation was of degree 2. And you can do a sum of square relaxation. Just think of it as just the cost function and everything here are just polynomials of degree 2k in the quaternion. Okay, so we have this FDP where we solve up to frequency m. What we notice numerically is that for the multi reference alignment problem, the 1D multi reference alignment, actually also for multi reference alignment of, of images over the sphere, the SDP solution at the desired rank is even though you did relaxation, it gets the desired rank up to a certain level of noise with very high probability. So this relaxation is tight. Okay, we actually. 
we get the maximum likelihood solution. So even though the search space is exponentially large and actually this SDP finds the, maximum, the global maximum likelihood in, in polynomial time. And the nice thing about the SDP is it gives us a certificate. Okay, so we just check if the ranks were correct, we got the maximum likelihood. So it can be considered as a viable alternative to heuristic methods like mutation maximization or ultimate minimization. So CoreLEM is still a work in progress, so we have an implementation that uses uh, ABNN, and right now we're able to solve for about 500 rotations. So we're trying to make it scale even more. Okay, so everything that I presented today, you can find in those references. So the early work on SDP that is the Gomez Livingstone is in this paper in Time Imaging. We started working with Moses Charlika, who's worked with my former student Alfonso and the former senior thesis student uh, Andrew Zhu. And this was published in ICCF. Uh, Kam's method, if you want to learn more about it. So this is where we start doing polynomial matrix retrieval with my student uh, Tijal and former postdoc uh, Ken Cha. Uh, the work in progress for CoreIM is with uh, Tifong Chen, who is still at the PHPM working with me. Maybe now we should change the title to two sets of a compact group. And <coughs> with Roy sits here, we are working on extending this method also to the form of heterogeneity, meaning that it's more than just one structure, like you asked before. And the way we do it, just very, very briefly, for example, if you have two structures, you can think of solving the problem of a larger group, which is the direct product of S03 and, and Z2. Okay, Z2, just to tell you, it belongs to class, to class B. And everything that I showed here is just generalized very naturally. There are lots of symmetries that come into play. But if you do the Z2 analog of, of what I showed here, you get, let's say if you do the ZK, if you have say K clusters, you'll get to max K cut. It's only that's in progress. So it falls very ni nicely. Okay, and all the men- Do you know how many of them you found? No. Hopefully you can estimate it on the data. So we, we have some ways of, of doing it. But so all the methods that we developed are also freely available in, in, as, as a open source software that you can download from here. It's called Aspire Algorithm for Cross Party Reconstruction. So it's a good time to stop because my voice. On the, mol on the molecule. On the molecule, yeah, the structure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, the question is what, what invariants survive on the, on the projection? Exactly. So, so it's not studied in generality so much. No, that's why we study it now. Yeah, yeah, no, I it's good for no, us. No, I mean, I, I, mean, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, not like know where to look, but it's a very nice question. Right. Right, so so, uh, so so yeah, so <coughs> so for example, for the one D multiverse assignment, you can build a tensor by taking the let's say three of the tensor by taking the product of three frequencies, and <coughs> and then I mean there are two ways of of, of of viewing it. If if you forget about the bispectral, okay, then this tensor. You, took, you take any three frequencies, okay? Then it's not invariant. But it's, this tensor is going to be of rank L because our L gives some possible shift. 
So now the question if we can factorize this tensor and find its rank L of estimation. And it turns out that for a tensor of rank, size L by L by L, if its rank is at most L, then there, is actually an, there is an easy way of doing it, called the generic algorithm. But we're not sure if it's so stable. So that's why we also developed the other tool that hopefully will be more stable. Right, so, so I know it in, in the, only for the 1D emotion of China, the SVT basically give us rank, the desired rank. But even though we relax the maximum likelihood formula, we find a solution that satisfied the relaxed times rank. So we know that we found the, the global solution. This is also experimental. Experimental, it's an experimental observation. It's not a theoretical case. Right. So even say you prefer to use the computation maximization because it's much faster, you can then use the SBT just to certify the solution to be sure that what you find is actually the global solution. Yeah. And what was the second question again? So some effect of extreme formation in the mean. What, what do you mean by extreme? That, that, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in the crime field, what we actually do is not maximum likelihood. We do regularize maximum likelihood. For example, <coughs> it's better to compare, the, I mean, we see it also numerically, it's better to work with the images that were first filtered or denoised and then put it through all this machinery because otherwise the distances between the lines are just heavily I mean, the distance is just reducing between the noise and not between the signals. So applying some kind of a filter before it helps. And this is equivalent to doing regularized maximum likelihood. So it seems that, that for the crying problem, regularization for maximum likelihood would be very useful. And that's also something that is known in the field. So when they do the projection, uh, template matching and iteration, they also do Regularization. So there's lots of stuff that was noticed empirically. All right. Thank you. Thank you.